Before we get started, I just wanted to say thanks to our longtime sponsors, Arius Medical Staffing, helping you, physical therapists or physical therapist assistants, find jobs all over this country with positions in all settings in all 50 states. Find out what they have for you at AURESmedical.com. That is AURESmedical.com. Make sure to follow us online at PT Pinecast and subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, or Google Podcasts. I absolutely love you. I love you, love you, love you. It's, it's awesome. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are live. Hello, hello. Must be live. It says it on the phone here. Uh, what's up? My name is Jim McKay, and welcome to PT Pinecast. This is a show that, that saves physical therapists from missing out on amazing insight, remarkable ideas, and motivational stories. That's exactly what we do. They say the best conversations happen at happy hour. Well, welcome to ours. Uh, make sure you subscribe to the uh, the show, iTunes, Spotify, Podcast, and now, of course, video ca- casting on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, at PT Pinecast. On all the socials. Uh, Great uh, show for you tonight. We're talking to a physical therapist. We're going to get into disordered eating. This might be something that I remember when I first, you know, brought this topic up with the staff, the crew here, they were like, disordered eating. How does that come into play in physical therapy? It's like, you're a physical therapist. Treat human beings. And if human beings are going through this, you should know about it. So now it makes complete sense. So we're going to get into that with uh, with Kevin today. Um, we uh, we do want to thank our friends at uh, Owens Recovery Science, single source for PTs looking for certification in personalized blood flow restriction rehabilitation training and the equipment you need to apply it properly in your clinical practice. Find them online at owensrecoveryscience.com. We just had a great episode with uh, Ryan Hendrickson, author of Tip of the Spear. He was a green beret, suffered a horrific injury overseas, was medically discharged, and then actually recovered with uh, with Johnny Owens and the crew at the Center for the Intrepid in Texas, recovered back to full active duty as a green beret, live fire. I mean, this guy's book is fantastic. Again, it's called Tip of the Spear. So I do want to give a nod to the guys from Owens Recovery Science. Let's bring in uh, tonight's guest, uh, Kevin Bursiaga, is on the show. And he's got bigger headphones than me. I feel like I need bigger headphones lately. <laughs> These are actually quite nice. Those are not. What are those? Yeah, they, uh, I don't know. You know, I can give you the model number after the show. That's but right. just you know, I like They it. work at the gym. They work on podcasts. I like it. Kevin, yeah. uh, what's going on, man? Welcome to the, to the show. You're a physical therapist. Give us like your, your superhero backstory in the whole nine. Like what brings you to the, the profession? Yeah, superhero. In my own sense, superhero. Actually, I didn't. I didn't want to be a physical therapist growing up. Uh, I didn't even know what it was. Yeah. And, and then I got into fitness, nutrition, and health in my second half of college. And that's that's kind of where my story starts. And then I did some personal training. And then that's when I stumbled into physical therapy. Oh, you know, I can make a career. You know, right. Doing this. Yeah. Then, find the, find that yeah. passion first and then figure out what's actually going to what's going to pay the bills and, and, and the whole nine. Yeah. You have to you have to live a little bit. Yeah. All right. Well, let's talk about this. That we'll, we'll go. We'll go macro to micro. Um, mm-hmm. Disordered eating is what we're going to kind of get into, and then we'll tell your story and how how that played a part into your you know into your journey into physical therapy. So when someone says disordered eating, uh, how do you how do you sum that up? What does that mean? It means you're eating in a way that is incongruent with your long term health. I think that's that's a good starting definition. But there is disordered eating. There, there are just dis- uh, eating disorder. So eating disorders is anorexia nervosa, bulimia nervosa, binge eating disorder, because those are your big three. But then you have disorder eating, which could be preoccupation or too much emphasis on what you eat. So it's not technically defined as an eating disorder, but it's definitely taking over your life. Uh, so there is kind of a technical difference there. So I think that if you are a disordered eater, it's a mindset. Okay. So how do you, how do you see it? Okay. All right. Well, let's not skip past any of those terms. Uh, I learned them in, you know, health studies in, you know, middle school and high school, again, in college and in, in PT education, just a little bit, right. They were brought up there, but, but let's go through some of those, right. You've got, you know, you got the, the big three that you kind of mentioned, give people the, the high level. I, I never think it's, I always think it's good to give people the reminder on what those things, how those things operate. Yeah. Anorexia nervosa. So, I mean, we'll start there. That is deliberate starvation. Now, what weight do you have to reach in order to, to be classified in anorexia? I'm not sure myself. I mean, right. there's, I'm sure there's some number, you know, 16, 17 BMI, you know, whatever it is. Lima nervosa, that is consuming large volumes of food and then deliberately purging it um, to get rid of it as fast as possible. And then binge eating disorder is consuming large amount of food without 
purging it. So it's kind of like bling it minus the purge. Right. Then, yeah. So those are the, the three big uh, eating disorders. But you mentioned some some other things that that fall under the disordered eating category. I didn't want you to skip past those. So 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 what are what are those? Kind of describe those briefly. Sure. The uh, one of the one example is what you call orthorexia. So not necessarily anorexia. You know, it's not. It's not like you are facing life and death, but it is this rigid preoccupation with food. You know, you're counting everything, you're measuring everything, and you're not necessarily getting any healthier. That's where I was, you know, second half of college. So it's not a clinical diagnosis, but it is this mental preoccupation, and it's like the most important thing in your life. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so let, let's skip ahead. You uh, you alluded to your story and how this came across mm -hmm. uh, you know, your journey and, and ultimately led to f for you to to become a physical therapist. So um, read your story on your website. You're pretty open about it, and I think your openness comes from you work with individuals who have disordered eating, uh, you know, in clinical practice, but also online. And we'll get into side hustles as well later. Why you should have one, um, but I wanted you to tell your story to the audience so they can understand why why you're so knowledgeable about this and why it means so much to you. No, I, I certainly wasn't my intention in life to do this. Oh, I'm 18. I think I'll develop an eating disorder and then show others how to, you know, that was not, that was not the plan uh, growing up. Just like the plan wasn't to become physical therapist either. It's, that's just how life goes. But like I said, that second half of college, I became really interested in fitness, health, nutrition, all that. Never really was in high school. I don't think I really cared. I remember eating Twinkies in high school. I mean, if that gives you any idea how much I cared. But then I just, it just became this obsession that second half of college. And then I, I mean, the intention was to get healthier, but I didn't do that. that right. Huge. Uh, I, I didn't, I didn't implement what I learned apparently. And then that turned into, like I said, the orthorexia. And then eventually I started chewing my food and then spitting it out. So it was kind of like, almost believe me, but not, not all the way. And then, but I did end up purging and then it was just binge eating. Then it was like binge eating fasting. It was just this giant roller coaster for 10 years. Yeah. 10 years. Never went the formal rehab route, never got formal therapy, except maybe a couple sessions that you can consider therapy. And I realized after like nine years, 10 years, it's like, okay, like we've got to fix this, but I cannot do what I've been doing. Yeah, so, and you said on your website when you when you share your story there, and we'll put the uh, we'll put Kevin's website in the uh, the comment section below and in the uh, the show notes of the episode. You you it, it kind of seemed like you would try to solve something and you'd overcorrect the other way, and then you'd try to solve it the other way. It seemed like there was there was this recognition of a of disordered eating. You were you were aware of it, um, but you just kept over directing and you were you were kind of ping ponging all over the place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's just black and white thinking that that I suffered with. It was like, okay, I've got to be perfect, or I'm just going to be really bad. There, it's like there was no middle road, or I've got to fix everything in one day, you know. So like tomorrow, I'm going to change everything. I'm just, I'm going to be like a butterfly leaving the cocoon, or you know, something like that. Mm -hmm. I just had this really faulty uh, uh, understanding of what it takes to change. Yeah, and I thought, yeah. You mentioned one of those examples which stuck with me after reading your website was if you um, you know made mistake, if you if you ate a little bit too much one day you would then completely turn the wheel the other way and you'd eat nothing or you'd you'd you'd, uh, you'd intermittent fast sometimes for days you said or you know you would you started counting everything you know you got a, you got a scale for Christmas and you were just counting everything macros and 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 putting putting everything on the scale and ping ponging and nothing was really working. What, what do you think drove that? What was the origin of that? Because I think that helps a lot of clinicians, people who know people with disordered eating or people who are treating them or people who might have it. What do you think the origins were? I know you can only speak to yourself, but what do you think it was? You know, the origins were when I was 20 or 21, which is a really vulnerable time. Yeah. That's, that's when a lot of these behaviors emerge, you know, that you know, 17, early 20s of uh, you know, for whatever, maybe sometimes it's because they do a sport and that sport is weight dependent. That was not my case. I think for me, it was uh, social isolation. One, I didn't have any friends at the time. Insecurity, didn't know where I was going, uh, lack of attention. I, I think it was just a confluence of factors. And I didn't, yeah. um, I didn't feel like I was really good at anything, but then I identified this and I thought I can do that. Like I can be leaner, fitter, 
and healthier than anybody else. So what was the what was the moment when you finally realized, hey, this is this is something I, I'm I'm not solving well, and then what'd you do about it once you, once you realized? Once you, I mean, you said it was about ten years. That's a long time. That's yeah. that's a lot of heartache. And you, you mentioned this in your course. If someone's, you know, living with this and going through this, that's a lot of heartache and effort and pain. You know, psychological, emotional, physical pain that you're going through. So what what really said, hey, I need I need to do something monumental. I can't just keep keep going and overcorrecting. Um, and then what'd you do about it? I, at first I didn't think I was doing anything wrong. That's what's kind of ironic about it. So in my early twenties, even my mid twenties, I thought I was doing the right thing. Now it's just seems so bizarre. It's like, why well, four or five days without eating? What are you, you know, <laughs> Kevin, what are you, what are you thinking? You know, get out of it. But um, I mean, that was just my, my, my state of mind. No, it didn't really change until I was in my, uh, my professional career. And I knew that whatever I had been trying, you know, like, well, just try again, just try harder, you know, just, you know, squeeze your fist harder, uh, be stronger next time. Uh, right. You know, that, that kind of approach, it's like, okay, how many times does this have to fail before you realize that that's not the solution? I don't have to change everything in one go. Why don't I just focus on the here and now, realize that I have everything, it, everything I need to fix this. I have all the willpower that I'm ever going to have. If it's not now, when is it? Sure. And I, it, that was that was a tough real, realization for me because I couldn't delay that change anymore. I couldn't just say, oh, well, tomorrow I'll do it. That's very comforting. But I realized that no force or no change in my circumstances was ever going to change it. I was that change. I know that sounds kind of like, you know, woo -woo, but it was true. I had all the tools and resources that I needed to make those changes. And I just yeah. accepted that I wasn't doing it, but I had to do it. Was it was it anybody externally who helped you see that? Was it just an evolution and you being able to see that yourself? I mean, you know, sometimes, you know, you can hear the same thing a hundred times, and sometimes the hundred and first time it's just like, oh, it, you know, the light bulb comes on. Or, or what was it for you? For people who might be listening, who might be identifying with this, or might know someone who's identifying with something similar. I think that's why it took so long because I didn't have that external voice. You know, nobody knew about it. I didn't tell anybody. Yeah. Uh, I was just kind of like dealing with it on my own. And it's like, I've got to figure this out. And had I had that, that voice or that mentor or somebody to, you know, to show me what to do, then yeah. who knows? I mean, I could have overcome this in my early twenties. I would have forgotten about it. And, you know, and then I would have just moved on with my life. That's part of the reason why I do this. It doesn't take this long. Right. Problem. You don't need to waste time doing it. Yeah. You explain in the video on your uh, your website that, you know, it took you 10 years to learn some of these lessons that you share with people. Um, and just to just to orient people, you have a 13 week, right, three month course that you people go through and you kind of walk them through. Um, and you say, you know, it took me 10 years to learn these lessons. I'm going to share it with you and we're going to go through this in three months. So um, what works and what doesn't? That's what I wanted to to kind of give people the overview. So if our audience pretty much primarily physical therapists, physical therapist uh, assistants and students. What are the things that we should be doing as healthcare practitioners if we recognize some of these disordered eating behaviors in our patients? And then what works and what doesn't? Well, what what doesn't work is thinking that you're going to change everything in one day. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of like you're rolling the dice or playing the lottery. It's like on this day, everything will change. And then you get to that day and you're still the same person and nothing has changed. Or you have a change in your background and you're still the same person. You know, your habits tend to follow you yeah. wherever you go. Like you have to ha be an active participant in this. And a, a lot of that resistance comes from that idea that if you think you have to overhaul your entire life in, in one day, you're going to experience a lot of resistance because that's that's a tall order. Right. Right. Like I've got to change everything. And one day, well, I think I'll just wait another one or two months. That definitely doesn't work. So I think yeah. if we're teaching change, then why don't we focus on the small changes that you can make? You know, what's what's one thing you could do today that would move the needle a little bit? Can you do that? Great. Let's start there. Yeah. I mean, just change change disordered eating into uh, mobility or strength or stamina um, and you aim for the behavioral change. That's where the real change happens. And no, you would never have someone, um, you, you would never actually think that that was going to happen overnight. 
right? You know, and I, I heard, I, I forget where I heard this. I think it was in PT school, which was, hey, if it took you 10 years to get to where you are right now, do you honestly think it will change in one overnight or one week or one month? Like it took 10 years to get here. It's probably going to take some time. I mean, not 10 years to, to work our way out of this, but let's not be naive and think we're going to change things overnight. It's just not, it's not sustainable. Yeah. Or I mean, think about what it takes to become a physician. You know, it's four years university, four years med school, and then who knows how long your residency is going to be. You know, right. it depends on, depends on which route you, that you take. But it's or it's kind of like what's that joke? You know, the overnight success was ten years in the making. Yeah, you know, you only see that la you only see them cross the finish line. You don't see the other one hundred and forty point six. You know that that's behind them. It's like, wow, overnight success? No, not really. Yeah, yeah. All those all those overnights. I I let off a, a great radio interview with uh, with a band from Australia once, and they had been you know kind of knocking around you know, the minor leagues and finally had a breakthrough hit. And I started off by saying overnight success. And I watched and I was doing it on purpose because I had a pretty good rapport with the lead singer. And my first question was exactly that, which was how many overnights do you think it took before you had that overnight success? And he, he was, as I've been working since I was 16, he was probably in his thirties right there. And he's like, but I loved what I was doing, but he's, he's like, I realized I needed to have a bunch of micro changes to have a macro breakthrough. And that always stuck with me is as something mm -hmm. I need to pay attention to. Um, so behavior change is definitely something, but that's in our scope. Um, physical therapists might be thinking disordered eating. We never really studied that. Um, you know, we've had Patrick Berner on the show, who's a registered dietitian and a, a, a physical therapist, kind of that dual hat. Um, why should physical therapists really pay attention to those who are suffering from disordered eating or any of those eating disorders that you mentioned? Um, I think I know a pretty good couple of answers, but I'm pretty sure you, you got more than me. Yeah. Well, we have to consider the whole patient because this isn't just a physiological issue. It's a mental, yeah. mental health issue. In fact, I would say it's more mental health than it is physiological. It's, it's a mental health issue with physiological symptoms um, or physiological manifestations. And if we're going to be the like the go to healthcare provider, then we need to understand these these issues. You know, we have to go beyond muscles and joints and consider the whole patient. Yeah, when I when I started doing my clinical rotations, I remember I thought, man, I'm just going to get in there and I'm just going to show those patients exactly all the things I know. Yeah. And what I realized really quickly was that uh, patient education and what you're not saying when you're listening um, was actually where I saw the most light bulb moments. And I remember just thinking, like, we, we just went to school for you know a year and a half, two years before we did our first clinical rotation. And what I'm actually seeing the most change on is the thing that. The thing that we should be really, really good at as humans, which is asking questions, listening to the answers, being thoughtful about our responses, repeat, um, not discounting clinical knowledge at all. But that's where a lot of a lot of the magic happens. Uh, question from uh, somebody out there watching live. Cookie's bringing up this. Uh, do you work with a nutritionist, dietitian or psychologist in your program? How much of that of the information that you share um, came from outside sources? You mentioned not having an outside source in your in your story. Um, how much of that do you do you bring into either your program or your clinical practice? How much how much of the inform on um, information well, on like yeah like research or like you know I'm sure you you know you read into stuff and you know you're 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 drawing from personal experience like mm -hmm. your story but there's got to be some more of that I'm sure you're 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 rooted in evidence as well yeah so I mean, just as a disclaimer I'm not a dietitian by trade right. so I have to like I have to stay within my lane right? correct so I can teach basic principles of healthy eating but if they have really if they have something specific to their condition then i have to refer out I mean, not only that not only is that the honest thing to do it's the legal thing to do sure. anyway and one thing i would like to do is start making alliances with other dietitians that can provide more specific advice for these people because some of them do and sometimes i reach a limit to what i can provide just sounds like building a really good network and knowing who the go-to people are in your neighborhood well yeah it's like being a pt and understanding when to refer out you know does it what else does this person need well, for example if i had a patient I, and it, like they had some pelvic pain you know i'm going to contact the person in my network who understands pelvic pain it's like hey this is a provider and she really knows what she's doing why don't you go and, see her yeah it's going to get the patient to where they want to be more efficiently exactly i mean that's yeah, that's a skilled intervention, right? Just connecting this patient with the resources that she needs to get the proper care. 
Yeah. So what, what, what do you do in terms of talking nutrition with patients? Nutrition is within our scope of practice. Mm -hmm. um, you have to know by, by, again, I'll just throw this disclaimer out there too. Scope of practice varies by state. So make sure you know what your state practice act is, but you should know that because you're a good licensed physical therapist, no matter where you are. Um, so talking nutrition w with patients, uh, why is that important as a physical therapist, no matter who you're working with, whether they have, whether they're suffering from disordered eating or not? If they're not, if they're not feeding themselves properly, they're not going to get the results, right? So their results are your results and you want happy customers and you want healthy customers or patients, however, however you want to call it. Right. Uh, but sometimes I get questions like, oh, what, what should I do about, you know, the weight loss? Or I don't like, for example, the other day I got a question, like, I don't like insure. What are some alternatives? You know, like, or my mother's losing all the weight. What can we do to stimulate appetite? And yeah, we can certainly address those. But like I said, if it gets really specific, you know, you need to refer to the other member of the healthcare team. But yeah, like you said, that's that's something we need to talk about more. And I wish they emphasized it more in the in the DPT curriculum. Right. Well, that's why we have, why we have podcasts, Kevin, so we can show <laughs> we've uh, we've skipped past because there is a lot of information yeah. to go through in two to three years, whatever we're doing. Um, love that you're out there doing this. Love that you're making uh, making a point of being that that second person in the room for people who are uh, disordered might, might be living through disordered eating. Um, but you turn this into something else outside of just your practice. You turn this into, and I alluded to this earlier, which was like an online course. So let's start with there. Like, why is it, why is it important to have an online side business? Why, why'd you do this? And then what goes into creating one? You know, what, what, what made you get up one morning? And be like, I'm going to create a course for people that I know are on a journey or should be on a journey that I've gone through and then, then we'll talk about how to how to actually do that. Yeah, uh, I originally did not want to do this because I didn't want to share my story. I just wanted <laughs> to. You know, with you, there's a lot of like, ah, I wasn't going to be a PT. I wasn't going to do this. But then you're you you get begrudgingly brought into it. Yeah, I really did. And uh, you know, when I when I graduated, this certainly was not my intention. But I knew almost as soon as I passed my board exams, like five years now, that I want I didn't want to just be a staff PT. You know, I wanted to, to go above and beyond. I wanted to be entrepreneur. I wanted to make a good living doing this. I wanted to take some risks and that's what I'm doing. But the problem was those first you know, year and a half in the field, I just didn't know what. Sure. You know, what, what am I going to do? What am I going to provide? It's like, yeah, you can want to be an entrepreneur, but you have to solve a problem. Now that seems so obvious. <laughs> you know, it was staring me in the face. Like, this is your problem and go solve it and then show others how they can do the same. So I knew I wanted to be the entrepreneur, but then it was like, okay, what? Then I found this. It's like, okay, but then how? And I'm still in that state. I'm, but three years ago, I didn't know how to get any customers. I didn't know how to get any traction. I didn't know anything about YouTube. I didn't know, I didn't know anything about anything. So it's kind of like going to school. It's like, yeah, I want to do this, but there are some skills that need to be learned. Sure. On the way. And I feel like yeah. you started from the right spot though which is what problem am i going am i going to solve and you did that so it's your you it's an empowered eating um um course uh we'll get the link in the show notes and the we'll link in the comments right there but we'll bring it up on the screen and it really if you go through this website what you're really doing is over and over and over again well first off you tell your story in this video right there if people take a, a uh -huh. listen to you um and you really just what I think you're doing is you're highlighting in different ways over and over and over again, multiple times, the things, the narratives that people are thinking or might be thinking, or you probably put yourself in your shoes when you were 17, 18, 19, 20, thinking like things like this. How did I get to this point? What happened? If you're mm -hmm. thinking that to yourself, ask, why do you sleep? What if I'm destined to live this way forever? And what you're doing is you're showing people with words multiple times over and over and over again. That if you're here, and you want to be somewhere else, which is not here, not living like this. I am the path because I've done it before. And you position yourself. We've talked about this before. Um, you position yourself more like Yoda and less like Luke Skywalker. Like, yes, it's great that Kevin has this story that went through this journey. But if, if you made your website, if you made your YouTube videos all about Kevin and how great I am, I'd be like, well, that's cool for you, but I don't know where I fit in. And I feel like your website with your empowered eating system um you highlighted a lot like i'm yoda i've done it i understand where you are i can help you but you've got to do all the heavy lifting i can just show you how exactly like this is that's that's the whole power of stories you know, like this is my story and then i tell it so that 
not because I'm proud of it in any way or, you know, it's just, well, I just want to air out my dirty laundry. No, I do it so that people can read it and um, maybe and it speaks the, to them. Sure. It's, spe- it's right. It's, it's got to speak to them. Like, okay, I, you, you, you understand me. It's like whenever you're complaining about a problem, people are kind of looking at you like, I don't really understand it. You're like, okay, well, you can't help me solve it if you don't even understand it. Yeah. Of course, you have to show that authority. Like, yes, not only do I understand what you're going through, I've gone through it and I can walk, I can help you walk this journey yourself. So putting together a program like this, you highlighted a problem. It doesn't have to be disordered eating for someone, for a physical therapist listening or watching this. Um, once you've highlighted that problem, you, you want to be, you want to cycle pain free. Uh, you know, you want to be able to run faster without pain, whatever. What's the next step to actually putting that class together? Yours is, is 13 weeks, but there, there are courses of, of different lengths. Where do you start? I would start with offer an audience before you even build something like this. I mean, keep in mind that the, the page you're looking at, it has been three and a half years in the making. Sure, sure. Like when I first started this journey, there's no way I could have written that, you know, and finding the resources necessary to build that and come up with an offer, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So figure out, and you can do this now. It says, okay, who, what problem am I solving? Who am I solving it for? Okay, and then go into your own journey. Maybe it's not your own personal journey, but let's just say you mentioned you know, cycling without pain. Maybe you help cyclists overcome cycling pain, even though you haven't had it yourself, but maybe you've right. gotten them that result and maybe you're really into cycling. You know, it's like, let me show you a story about, you know, Bob and he couldn't ride his bike anymore and I helped him, ride, that sort of thing. Right. So who who is your target audience here? And then what's your offer? I mean, that's, it's like 90% of business and then everything else is just connecting yeah. yourself to. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, we've told, we've, we've, we've used this paradigm before on this and I use this a, a lot of different parts of my life, which is what do you do? How's it going to make my life better? What do I need to do to get it? If, if your audience, not you, you need to be able to answer those very clearly, but if your audience after interacting with you or your materials cannot answer those questions very clearly, you're doing something wrong. It's never the audience's fault. And me looking at your website for five minutes, I was like, got it. This answers all the questions. I know what he does. Uh, I know exactly how it's going to make my life better if this speaks to me. And I know exactly what I need to do to get it. So I thought that was a really good example. Um, why should other physical therapists, why is it important to have an online business or a side hustle if you feel entrepreneurial? And I see a lot. I mean, I feel like every day physical therapists are branching out and doing things that they were not doing three, five, seven years ago. Why, why is that getting, why is that important now? And I feel like getting even more important. Well, I mean, look, I mean, look at the, the economic situation we're in now. Yeah. You know, we were a recession proof uh, industry. Yeah. Just, just a year ago. Yeah. And then nobody saw this coming. It's like, bam, you know, they, and you know, outpatient clinics had to close. They put surgeries on hold and Did not. Uh, it, it was just a massive disruption. I mean, even, even in our, our industry and you know, my heart goes out to the ones who are graduating now. I mean, it's a, I mean, I'm sure everything will come back, but this is why, I mean, that's, that's the answer, right? I mean, you have to be a little more entrepreneurial now. You can't just be the staff PT who shows up five days a week. Right. And collects a paycheck. Not only that, it's more rewarding. You're going to have, is it, wouldn't it be nice to have a second stream of income, you know, in, in case something like this happens? I mean, so it's just more security, more fulfilling, right? And it's going to lead to a more dynamic career. You're not going to burn out seeing 20 patients a day. So is this completely automated, this 13 week course? Or are they getting time with you? Because I know that's a question that comes up a lot there because there's some online courses that can be completely video. You know, you can pre-record and they're completely automated. And as soon as they go into week one, everything just is is stepwise. How does yours work? There, It's a combination. So it's my course plus personal instruction, which I think is a lot more powerful because yeah. if you think about it, the, the cost of information is basically zero. You, right? you, I mean, Google, you can Google it enough. You can find it. Yeah. <laughs> you can go to, what is it? Udemy and buy courses for 10 or $15. I think what people are paying more for these days um, is experiences. Yes. hundred you know, percent. And, and connection instead of just the information. Not only that, I don't want people to just consume a bunch of modules. I want them to work with me. You know, I want to take them personally through that journey. Yeah. And you're also dealing with something really personal with their, per- which, if someone is reading that web page again and they're saying I relate with this and your journey you you highlighted was 10 years. If they're seeing that, they want a personal connection. They want to know, 
yeah, but what do I do when I get stuck on this and I can't figure it out because I've already gotten here because I've already ping ponged around and I've done diets or I've done this or that. So I think you added that personal touch. Again, this kind of goes parallel with telehealth um, right now, which is there's that personal touch. It's not just a mm -hmm. video. Yes, you can go to YouTube and look for a bunch of videos and you can you can find things online. The cost of information is at an all time low and get lower. Um, but that personal touch, and that's where I think physical therapists uh, can really uh, succeed and, and make a difference. So uh, love your story. Love the fact that you're sharing it. Thank you for doing this. I think the people that you inter interact with uh, uh, get a lot out of it. Would uh, would love to have you back on the show and uh, maybe talk some more about this. But before you go, we got to play three questions. Are you ready for three questions? Sure. One way to find out. Let's do three questions. <laughs> yeah. All right, three questions brought to you by our friends at Arius Medical Staffing, A-U-R-E-U-S medical.com. Leaders in travel physical therapy. Uh, if you're thinking about moving about the country, we did that with clinical rotations. Kevin, where are you located geographically? Where do you live? I'm in Central California, Modesto. Okay. Where'd you, and you went to PT school at St. Augustine. Which, yeah. campus, which campus did you go to? Uh, the original one, Florida. Rough life. Um, <laughs> right. Um, but if you could go anywhere in the country and do, it's almost like travel PT is almost like paid clinical rotations. You get to pick where you want to go setting geographic location. Where would you want to go? If you go anywhere in the country for just a couple months and do whatever you want. I know this sounds crazy, but North Dakota. Yeah. Why not? Just I mean, totally like wide open, big sky, totally new, totally different climate just isolated i could totally do it for two months hack your career you can do it like hey three months get paid to do it i don't know it sounds like a vacation to me i know they've always they've always had this rotation in my knot and i've just never i don't know i just never done it it's one of the first ones um that they presented with me i think it was arius in fact that presented that to me a few years ago Who so we got one my knot yeah um <laughs> second question is a way uh excuse me a what question what is something you have watched or read or listened to a book movie podcast something that you think the audience could get value from sure anything by kelly mcgonigal she's a stanford psychologist just she might have a tedx talk i'm not sure but she's written several books on human psychology so anything by her just read it yeah yeah, the more stuff I dive in psychology, the more I'm just like, wow. Like, I kind of liked psychology when I was like, you know, an 18 year old undergrad. And then I don't know what, when I, the more, I, the, you know, grew up, listened to like read some Adam Grant stuff and, and like, you know, the, the Seth Godin's and Simon Sinek's, a lot of that like business, why psychology, like, why are people driven this way? It's just really interesting. It's all rooted in psych, in psychology and, and, and the study of the mind. It's, it's really, really interesting. So I like when people bring that stuff up. Uh, last question is a who question. We start and end with people. Uh, who is someone the audience should know more about? Uh, I guess I just blew that on my second question. There you go. <laughs> uh, well, Jocko, I mean, he's kind of common. I mean, everybody kind of knows him. I mean, maybe they don't, but. Jocko Willink. Yeah, Jocko Willink. Yeah. Um, Daniel Lieberman, he's another psychologist. He's over there at Harvard. Yep. Uh, yeah, I think you'll, as you enter this profession, you'll learn that psychology is really important. Yeah. So it's it not is. it's it's not just A and P. You know, yeah, we, is we only need one prereq for many for most schools to get in. I think I I you know mine was like intro to psych. I feel like if I were to change something, a lot of people want to have more business classes in PT school. I'm not against that, but man, I think psychology is definitely something we should look into as well. Yeah, totally. Yeah, pa patient patient provider connection. Big. I think that you could do a whole three or four unit class on that yeah yeah uh kevin appreciate your time we'll make sure we uh we, we share the uh the link in the show notes uh for the audio of this as well uh appreciate your time last thing we do on the show is the parting shot all right parting shot is brought to you by our friends the academy of orthopedic physical therapy find them online at ortho pt Dot org. If you're going to level up your orthopedic game, why not do it with the Academy of Orthopedic Physical Therapy? We've got some courses uh, coming from them, another contest coming out. They've got tissue tolerance, which is new. That's getting rid of the micro level. And they've got the running athlete, macro level. 
all things orthopedic. Find them again online again at orthopt.org. Uh, parting shots is your last chance for a mic drop moment. What's the last thing you want to leave with the audience as we wrap up right now? If there's something you want to change in your life, change it today. Start the process and then be patient. I like it. Short and sweet to the point, man. Micro changes for macro breakthrough. That's what I'm going to stick through. Uh, Kevin, appreciate your time. Thanks for sharing. And uh, we'll talk again soon, man. Thank you. Love the PT Pinecast? Yes. Yes. Support the show by telling a friend or by leaving a review on iTunes or Google Play. All right. Show today brought to you by the Brooks Institute of Higher Learning, an innovator in providing advanced post-professional education. Brooks IHL offering continuing education courses in numerous specialty areas, six PT residency programs, an OMPT fellowship, as well as challenging but rewarding internships. The IHL specializes in the translation of information from evidence to patient management. Learn what they can do for you to support your professional development at brooksihl.org. Our home on the internet. ptpinecast.com. Created by Build PT. Build PT provides marketing services specifically for private practice PTs. From website development and hosting. Providing content marketing solutions for PT clinics across the country. See what Build PT can do for you today at buildpt.com. The PT Pinecast is a product of PT Pinecast LLC. It's poured fresh by me, physical therapist, Jimmy McKay. Ingredients are sourced by our chief connections officer, Sky Donovan from Marymount University. And it's brewed fresh by producer and physical therapist, Juliet Dassinger. And by producer and creator, second year PT student, Bridget Nolan from Sacred Heart University. PT Pinecast is a podcast that saves physical therapists from missing out on amazing insight, remarkable ideas, and motivational stories. Make sure to follow us online at PT Pinecast and subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, or Google Podcasts. I absolutely love you. I love you, love you, love you. It's it's awesome. <laughs> Thanks so much for listening. And if you found value in the show, all we ask is that you tell a friend. This has been another pour from the PT Pinecast. The PT Pinecast is intended for educational purposes only. No clinical decision-making should be based solely on one source. While care is taken to ensure accuracy, factual errors can be present. More on the show at ptpinecast.com.